All right, episode 185. Once again, we're joined by Dr. Christopher Verga, author of Cold War, Long Island, among many other books featuring Long Island history, uh, often unwritten and untold histories at that. Uh, Dr. Christopher Verga is here today to discuss with us the history of Robert Moses and how our parkways are, well, racist. And it's very true, they actually are. Uh, Dr. Verga, welcome to Backpacking America once again. No, thank you for having me. Yeah, the book uh, I reference here is the one I wrote, Saving Fire Island from Robert Moses. Um, very, very interesting character in uh, Long Island history, let's put it that way. So, you know, we, we I did cover like a very long time ago I, uh, on an episode, it was a little miniseries called the Long Island Miniseries, and I covered how, you know, the parkways were designed to keep black people out of, you know, the Levitt towns and the beach communities that littered the highways. Uh, so, you know, that's one aspect of it, but Fire Island is an aspect that, you know, was completely alien to me, mostly because I forget it exists, but, um, you know, if you could, it, you know, enlighten us a little bit on the general history with the parkways and specifically on Fire Island and, and how he tried to, you know, make that kind of one of his weird racial utopias. Okay. So, uh, interestingly enough, um, about the parkways, um, Sid Shapiro is his top engineer. He's the guy that's going to get things done. Rabbit Moses is the pitch man that says what he wants. Sid Shapiro is the guy that's going to design things. So when we talk about Robert Moses, we've got to deconstruct his role here. He is not a great designer. It's Sid Shapiro that designs things. Moses gives him the, what he wants done. Sid Shapiro is the one that designs it. Now, building on what Sid Shapiro says is, that, and, and like, what Sid, sorry, building on what Sid Shapiro does is pretty much now we talk about the parkways. He was the one that actually designed a lot of the parkways. So when we talk about the overpasses being too low, so city buses can't come in, uh, I lived in Moses Archives practically for <laughs> weeks in New York City, and uh, it's uh, the it's the, um, like New York City historical uh, collections. Uh, the library on 42nd, the one with the lions in front, they have all of Moses' papers, all of his documents there. And I practically lived in that archive. Um, and I have to say, I saw nothing that said he made the parkways lower, but that doesn't mean he did. Um, that doesn't mean that he didn't do that. Like, it, it did not get done. Like, let me tell you something that's very credible that did prove that. Sid Shapiro. When Sid Shapiro was speaking to um, Robert Caro, the guy that wrote The Power Broker, he's the one that Robert Moses told him off the record, have the overpasses lower so city buses can't come in. So you keep the city folk out of Long Island. So Robert Moses, when he talked about race, he did things covertly. Mm. You know, he said those people, those degenerates, you know, the people that run amok. And he also carried these racial practices in his hiring throughout his parks. Um, in his park, such as Jones Beach, he refused to hire black and Puerto Rican people because of the simple fact that, you know, it models on who he wants them to come into the park, who he wants to come in the park. Um, the other thing about Moses, uh, you know, there's been protests against him about this in the 60s. You know, they closed down Ocean Parkway, you know, when you have Congress racial equality protesting about his hiring practices. So he was a rampant racist. Uh, even when he built the Cross Bronx Expressway, he built it right through a black community when he didn't have to build through a black community. Um, once again, he, uh, when they said, why are you building through the black community? He's like, oh, stop rallying up the animals. This is stuff Moses used to say. <clears throat> so he definitely was a racist, but in his papers, he was very covert about it. You know, he always put down, I don't want to bring the degenerates from the city. I don't want to bring this. But on personal levels and conversations, he was more blunt on who he did not want coming in. Right. Yeah. I mean, I you know that's yeah that that makes a lot of sense. I that even you even hear that today too. Like they, they you hear more from the older crowd, but they'll say all oh, degenerates and mutts and all this other crap. And I'm like, yeah, I think I know what you're saying. Um. Yeah. So so how did um so his legacy obviously has been you know whitewashed for a while and you know I know that there has been protests you know against him and his memorialization but you know now you know we have the parkways actually it's just funny that now the parkways you know anyone can drive down the parkways at any time so we get to make him roll in this grave a little bit but how does this uh, <laughs> yeah. so so what's the story with Fire Island so so how did um fire island get affected by this specifically 
Okay, so um, let's deconstruct Moses again. Moses is seen as this great preservationist, this great uh, environmentalist, uh, which is a facade. Um, he's also seen as someone democratizing the landscape, which we already constructed as BS because we discussed who we wanted to come in here by socially engineering the size of Owen Pass, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the Fire Island book, Saving Fire Island from Robin Moses, that book deconstructs the vision of him as a conservationist and preservationist. So whatever was not in the power broker is in the Fire Island book, uh, Saving Fire Island from Robin Moses. <coughs> Excuse me. So, make a long story short, Moses loved building highways. His dream was to build a highway that traverses the South Shore. Um, so, a road that goes from Ocean Parkway to Montauk. That's what he wanted. Hmm. So, he wanted to, so, he built his Ocean Parkway, uh, and it knocked down a bunch of communities. He took out a bunch of communities, uh, such as Gilgo. He cut Oak Beach in half, et cetera, et cetera. His next place was to go to Fire Island, which is 17 towns. So he pretty much wanted to level 17 towns and make a couple of exit ramps to keep some of those towns. And uh, pretty much the 17 towns of Fire Island would not be here today if Moses got his way. There would be kind of a four-lane highway, which is ridiculous because Fire Island at its most narrow point is 400 feet wide. So four lanes on four... Yeah, it's ridiculous. That's Water Island. Water Island's 400 feet wide in high tide. So I want to see how you're going to make a four-lane highway on that. But, you know, Moses was not effective on making things at last. You know, he was just effective on disturbing shit, on disturbing things and uh, constructing his highways. And that doesn't necessarily mean they'll last after a hurricane. <clears throat> so, yeah, sorry. No, don't, no, 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 don't be sorry at all. Um, so, oh, 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 oh. yeah. I just, I heard you cough, so I was like, oh. <laughs> oh, no, no, I thought you were saying something. I cut you off. Sorry about that. That's what I thought. No, keep going. Um, I'm, I'm in yeah. world. Yeah, so he wanted to level these 17 communities to build a four-lane highway that traversed through Fire Island. And Fire Island's really interesting because it's the only place in the tri-state area where there's no major roads. The roads in Fire Island are little pedestrian paths. Um, you can't really access Fire Island unless you got a boat or or a four by four. But that's the beauty of Fire Island because you're preserving the wildlife, you're preserving the nature, you're preserving this great barrier island. And this great barrier island kind of prevents us from getting flooded on the south shore. Yeah. Um, so here's the here's the other thing. Like to hold dunes together, you need a root system. I don't think this is controversial here. You know, this is common sense 101. You need a root system to hold dunes together. You know, that holds the sand together. Uh, Moses' argument was, well, you can put a four-lane highway to cap off the dunes. Cement will hold sand right. together. You know, if, you, if you're not a spiritual person, that's fine. But even in the Bible and most spiritual texts, it says never build your house on sand. You know, <laughs> and let's just take away the spiritual context of that and just the common sense factor. You know, um, why would you build you something build... on sand? Exactly. There's no foundation. <laughs> But, but Moses was pretty decisive about building this four-lane highway. He was going to uproot all the root systems of the, uh, of, the, of the dunes, level all 17 towns, and build this four-lane highway. And he told all the towns, if you agree with me, I'll put an exit ramp in your town and preserve some of the houses. Oh, so wow. Thanks, Robert. He's going to... Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, that's going to be awesome, right? <laughs> so he's going to go for this grandiose vision from the hurricane of 1938 all the way up to the Easter, uh, to the uh, Ash Wednesday storm of 1960s. Um, I think 1962. Sorry about that. And uh, he's going to pursue trying to build this highway. And uh, every time there's a storm and a hurricane, he's going to use the fear of that and saying, we need my highway. We need my highway. And uh, the book essentially dives into all these 17 towns on Fire Island that don't get along, that don't talk to each other, that have nothing in common with each other, but they're all going to unify to get rid of Robert Moses. Hmm. And that's the beauty about it, because he is the power broker. Moses has more power than the governor. And all these towns are going to put together their resources to get rid of them. A friend of my, uh, my enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that's pretty much, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. 
um, that's pretty much what's going to happen. And Moses is not just going to have his highway stopped. He is going to get thrown from power in New York State. So that's what this whole book's about. <clears throat> Thanks, Fire Island. Holy shit. Book, so. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, excuse the coughing. I was getting over the flu earlier. Oh, so. I hope you're okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so he got rid of, they essentially, this is the Moses getting out of power. They're going to overthrow him through power because of this. Um, and, you know, the people that are going to be on the forefront of this is going to be the Barbash family and the Like family, Urban Like. Mm. Uh, the Barbash family, Maurice Barbash, uh, he's going to be a Jewish guy, and so is Urban Like. That's his brother in law. So these are Jewish guys. And, uh, you know, they're going to enjoy Fire Island coming out from the city, uh, and uh, they're going to realize most of Fire Island doesn't welcome Jewish people. Wow. So they're going to find an area in Doonwood, which is the community that they're going to wind up building, and their community is going to be open for everyone. And uh, that's the community the Barbash family built. And uh, while they're building this community so they can enjoy the beach and, you know, you know, and they, they, they feel it's okay because a lot of, okay, so a lot of places on Fire Island, they advertise this, you got churches, you know, like uh, we, got, we got restaurants and churches. So back then they used that as kind of a code word that Jewish people were not allowed. Wow. So the Barbash family, you know, they would vacation every so often in Ocean Beach, but they'll feel that uncomfortable this. So they went out and set out and built their own community in Dunewood, and Dunewood was pretty much a landfill for most of Fire Island. So they built this community that was open to everyone, and, uh, you know, it was nice. It was productive, you know. It's, uh, you know, it had the values that he wanted, um, which, you know, did not push people away because of their religion. And uh, then all of a sudden, Moses wants to level it. So he's going to be the one that unifies all 17 of these towns that have nothing in common to go with Moses. One of these towns just happens to be uh, Cherry Grove, which is one of the first openly gay communities in America. Really? And uh, Moses, oh yeah. Yeah, and like Cherry Grove, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be that community that Moses rails against all the time. And it's also gonna be a community that the Suffolk County Police are gonna run quote unquote sodomy raids on on a daily basis. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, and Moses is going to play into that. So make a long story short, all these communities in Fire Island are trying to distance themselves from Cherry Grove. Um, but Murray Barbash is not going to do that. He's going to embrace them. He's, got, he's going to be like, look, point of woods, you got to get along with Cherry Grove, despite your differences, because you guys have the same enemy. And um, that's what's going to make his networking, you know, so powerful. Yeah. And... Um, that's what's going to make it a success, essentially. So, so they, um, they ultimately <clears throat> succeed now, but still, Robert Moses has a long-lasting impact. We have Robert Moses State Park, the parkways are still here, and the communities in in um, I believe you said the Bronx were completely demolished, and then you know cities and uh, not cities, towns, towns, I guess, boroughs. I don't even know what you'd call them. I don't understand towns, the city towns, yeah, towns, and uh, you know some were split in half. You know, so the lasting damage is done, and I'm sure socioeconomically it's been devastating for those areas. But as as most highway development is now, Long Island, as we talked in our previous episodes, is socially engineered, and you know, partly thanks to Robert Moses. Well, actually, mostly thanks to Robert Moses. Um, now we're we're trying to push to make Long Island inclusive, and we're trying to build Long Island in a way that people, you know, it's affordable to live here. And it's not just for one or maybe two parts of a socioeconomic class. Now we want it to be for everyone. You know, how do we how do we expand into that that world while still having, you know, the, the permanent infrastructure of the LIE, the parkway system and the long Montauk Highway, which all of them are in disrepair, by the way, as you know, um, you can't even go on the LIE with I mean the LIE is comparable to roads in Afghanistan at this point maybe even worse uh Su Sunrise Highway is a little better but um you know where do we go from here we have such a uh reliance on public transit and such 
weak ability to build and maintain roads and bridges, you know, how do we break out of this social engineering designed by people like Moses? Um, it's not going to be easy, but I think we have to retrofit the suburbs with uh, more public transportation. Mm. Um, because look, man, you know, car based communities in the future, they're not going to work in the direction we're going. Unless everyone gets electric cars and you have electric substations everywhere to charge those cars, it, it's not going to work. We have to do more public transportation. Um, you know, Moses is the one that kind of killed off a lot of the public transportation. You know, there was a proposed light rail uh, that was supposed to go down the center of the LIE and those overpasses were supposed to be stops. Wow. But you know how Moses felt about city people coming into Long Island. So, yeah, you can imagine what happened to that. Yeah, got so. You. We need a more reliable, we need to retrofit the suburbs with public transportation. I'd love that. Affordable. Yeah, it'll be great because I personally hate my car. I can't. You know, that's I, just me. You see, I, I love my car, but the problem is if I want to go to Patchogue and have a couple of beers, I got to pay $50 to $100 for an Uber. Ridiculous. That's ridiculous. It's, yeah. um, but you know, you got to. It is. You got to look at. You got to look at. Well, I personally hate my car. You know, I drive it a lot. So uh, <laughs> okay, fair enough. I guess the. I guess the more. I guess the more you use it, the more you hate it. Um, but I live in a downtown area in Bayshore, and I chose this area not just because of the diversity for my family, which mirrors the diversity of my family, but the walkability. You know, I can I can walk to have a beer without worrying about a DWI. Um, I can walk to the delis. I can walk to the bakery. I can walk to the butcher. I can, I can walk to the train station. I can walk to the little odds and ends shop, you know, I can walk to the marina with my kids, you know? So, you know, and if I want to take a train in the city, I walk down to the train and it's, it's all within less of a mile. So walkability is going to be the thing, uh, you know, the walkable downtown thing, but you need to connect those buildings, those communities that don't have the downtown hubs so that that's going to be the question that's like yeah and i think uh yeah that exactly yeah pink's 100 percent car based and yeah pink's beautiful you know you got the woods you got the nature you know you got a lot of pine barren you know you got a lot of uh you know uh country pastoral look you know and you want to keep that character in the community but building like maybe a light rail would not be such a bad idea or a more or a more reliable bus route yeah, you know, I and I think buses. that's what we. I mean, you like, guys don't got buses out there. No, the bus stop. The only bus stop I see is on. Um, it's on South Country Road. It runs through. It runs from Patchogue or no, it runs from Sayville to Mastic. But the thing is that the the like I'm on a service road, so I basically like I'm cut off from everything. Like it's all car based. Um, I don't even live in the center of Yapank. So like, even if there was a bus system in Yapank. And it didn't hit, it wouldn't hit my area. So it's just like you have like the service roads and the people that live in those weird, you know, on those weird roads where it's kind of like, okay, like, what do I do? You know? Yeah. And I, no, I would and assume that... the project overall would cost at least like, I mean, it's not, it's no, per, it's no short cent either. It's, it's, it's a pretty penny. It's like five, I would say $500 million at least to get the entire what? island completely hooked up to busing. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. You know, you got you got a lot of communities, uh, you know, a lot of towns and communities across America that have been retrofitted with light rails and more suitable uh, bus systems. And it didn't cost nowhere near that. You know, mm. the, the, this is where this is where public and private funds can be, uh, you know, allocated appropriately. You know, this is uh, this is where you, you bang for your buck. You know, a, um, a good you analogy. Know, you know, I, I went to school in Oneonta, New York, and we had a public transit system. It was Oneonta public transit. It wasn't the greatest, but you could get a bus anywhere in the city. And then it took you to Cooperstown. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, but that, that's not that's not too expensive. Having a more reliable bus service in Suffolk County is not too expensive. But this is a way to beat back the Moses, uh, you know, the Moses legacy of, uh, you know, um, car-based suburbs. That's the only way to do it. You know, a more reliable bus system, expanding the light rails, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and I know it sounds crazy, but maybe maybe even bike sharing, you know, promoting some wellness is great, too. Like a lot of bike sharing programs and even just like more 
like road bike trails or if we uh, on the road um, More, fitness parks fitness parks are great too but we do have those we do have fitness parks but greenways that's what we need like if you look along 347 that greenway for bike trail is great yeah uh you know it's safe for people that commute around the smithtown area you don't have to worry about a truck taking you out on 347 um it's a separate divide you know making the roads safer for pedestrian you know like you know the roads are you get you get the results you want based on the design you have with the roads you know so if the roads are designed for cars and not for pedestrians and bikes you know you're gonna expect um no pedestrians and bikes so a lot of these constructions for the greenways is is, is a great way to combat it you know, but, you know, we, we have the ideas. We can retrofit the suburbs with light rails or bus service. You know, personally, I like the light rail idea. It's more of a permanent structure. You know, uh, most of Long Island was connected with light rails, trolley lines at one time. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're bringing something back that was here already. Yes. If you go to Northport and see the downtown, you can still see the trolley lines that once connected Northport. Wow. And I'm assuming Moses had a role in getting rid of those. Everything now, yeah. Roads, everything's roads. The car, the future, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everyone drives. That's Moses' vision. Everyone's in a car, in a car. That's what it is. You know, the whole concept of light rails, the uh, trains, MT. You no, know, that's 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 a bygone era. Everyone drives. You know, and um, and look at what the whole Moses. The roads. Look what's doing to the environment, man. You know, it's destroying the environment. Um, the roads, <laughs> excuse me, the roads, the environment, um, you know, that, you know, Adams talks about de Blasio's old vision zero, you know, look how many people are taken out just by walking freaking on the street, you know, yeah. um, you know, he cities and communities grow organically. They grow organically, you know, and there's designs to make them grow organically. You got to foster them through the design to grow organically. Moses gets got rid of all that organic growth. You know, he got rid of all that organic growth. Um, you know, through his constructions of the many project buildings in New York City that got rid of freaking uh, sense of community to uh, his roads that got rid of pedestrian traffic. You know, he got rid of the whole concept of what grows a community, you know. So, you know, you're supposed to do a layout for a community to grow organically. Moses doesn't have that in his layouts. So why do you think why do you think the true legacy of Mo Moses is being hidden? Like why why isn't it being acknowledged by city developers and and people in government now that you know the harm that it's caused? Like why do we still have parks named after him? Oh well, listen, the parks named after him is one thing. Um, that's that's one thing. We got to unpack this here for a second. But people knowing Moses' harm is another. Uh, the Sheridan Expressway is not the Sheridan Expressway no more. It's Sheridan Boulevard. They got rid of it and made a pedestrian uh, based road system there, you know, wow. so like his his designs are being dismantled little by little. You know, you're not going to dismantle the big design. The LIE is not going to ever be dismantled. Southern state, northern state, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the quote unquote big three, they're not going to be dismantled. But a lot of these little projects like the Sheridan Expressway going into the Bronx, you know, um they're going to be dismantled you know um also a lot of uh you know even ocean parkway when you got the bike lane there you know that was something moses would have not been approved of so a lot of his programs are being a lot of his projects have been retrofitted or are being retrofitted so that's number one they're questioning moses design and they're seeing the flaws in it now, when we talk about commemorating things, um, fun fact, Robert Moses named the park Robert Moses after himself oh, wow. as kind of an F. He named it as an F.U. to the people on Fire Island nice. because Robert Moses State Park is the only park you can drive your car on through Fire Island. That's it, because that's where his Fire Island four lane parkway ends. At his park, Robin Moses Park. At the lighthouse, you can't really drive, you know, unless you got a four by four, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when he left power, that it was originally called Fire Island State Park. That's what it was called. When he left power, he named it after himself so the people on Fire Island could see his name. It was actually him being vindictive. Um, he named it after himself to be spiteful to the Barbash and Like family and all the other people that fought him. So that's what the park was named after. So that, that was named after himself because he named it, you know. 
Um, so how we commemorate him, if you're talking about the statue, that's a different story. You know, that was put up after he died. Wow, that's crazy. So he, because I was looking at, um, as we were talking about it earlier, I was just doing some quick, like, Googling and Wikipedia-ing, sorry. And, um, you know, uh, I, I saw, like, mm-hmm. Robert Moses State Park. And, I, you know, I my old job, I used to do events down there. And really thinking about it, I'm like, wow, that sounds like a massive go fuck yourself. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, you're right. It is. Like, that's crazy. He, He's a monster. He did I, it on purpose. Looking at pictures of him, too. He was an asshole. He's an asshole. Yeah, he was miserable. He was miserable. He was freaking miserable. Um, you know, but the thing is, his mother was such a sweet lady and opposite. You know, his mother was uh, was a strong leftist person. She gave to the poor. She fought for equality. And then her son went in such an opposite direction. No one's seen that coming. And that's the crazy thing about Moses, you know? His mother was a saint, and Moses was the devil. Um, so... You know, he um, obviously had mommy issues. I, I guess, you know, <laughs> but he also had issues of self identity. Moses was Jewish, and, uh, you know, when he turned Episcopal and said he, he went around saying, I'm not Jewish, I'm Episcopal now, you know? So mm-hmm. I, I guess he had issues of just being Jewish per se, you know, because wow. after, after a while, he stopped acknowledging himself as Jewish. He's like, no, 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 I'm Protestant, you know? Uh, you know, Jewish is something to be proud of, you know, but um, I, I guess it's like shedding his identity he uh, had, you know, he looks miserable. for a new identity. He, he, he was like, there was another thing, um, uh, you know, Mary Sims, that was like his uh, one of his wives. So he had he had two wives, um, you know, um, one, his first wife was Mary. Right. Right. So. His wife, Mary, was sick. Uh, She was dying of uh, all these diseases, and he always worked. He refused to, uh, you know, he refused to, like, freaking really, you know, he refused to be at home and taking care of her. He refused to take care of her, you know? Jesus Christ. So he used to go to work all the time to do these designs, right? But he was having a uh, an affair with Mary Sims, his secretary. So that's actually really interesting. So when his wife died, you know, he just switched, you know, Mary's, you know, Mary Sims to Mary Moses, and the real Mary Moses died. So you know, he he, he had he wasn't really the best husband either. You know, he, he was flawed on many things. So let's put it that way. He, he was a really flawed individual. So so I guess the best way to gain knowledge is to sit in an archive for a month. Yeah, like <laughs> he got these memos that go back and forth. Um, he also manipulated elections, too. That's another really? thing. Really? Like, like wow. if you Yeah. If you, okay, so if you were an election, elected official um, and you were, went against his roads, he would actively campaign against you and push for state workers to vote against you. Um, so on election day, he'll give, he'll give state local, uh, local official, like local workers, uh, rides to the polls to vote against the person that's against him. Uh, Sylvester Wainwright, he was a congressman in the first district. He was strongly against Moses um, for his plan to build a uh, four-lane highway in Fire Island. He wanted to make it a national park. So Moses campaigned against Sylvester Wainwright and Otis Pike got, um, got elected. But to Moses' surprise, Otis Pike was against the four lane highway too. So he didn't see that one coming, um, you know, and uh, you know, stuff like this, he would manipulate elections. He'll freaking plant false stories in the news to freaking destroy uh, people that went against them. You know, he, he, he would get down in the mud, you know, Moses, um, you know, he, he liked power. And if you got in the way, he would freaking destroy you. Even journalists. Like, there's a famous journalist, like, very well known, uh, definitely an icon for Long Island. People kind of forget him sometimes. But, you know, he's the one that did investigate journalism for Long Island. You know, I know we forget a lot of our journalists now because no one really reads papers as much. And it's, hopefully we don't forget this name. Carl Grossman. I, w- I wrote the Cold War book with him. An amazing journalist. Gotta he got Carl Grossman... He got he got Carl Grossman blacklisted from writing for Newsday. To this day, because he wrote an 
I, well, no, now obviously he's not a well, Moses is not a golden calf anymore. Yeah. You know, Bob Carroll wrote a whole book about Moses, making him look bad, called the power broker. And he was a, he was a, a poem writer for the Newsday too. Oh, good. So at that time, he got called grocery and blacklisted from Newsday because he wrote an article that was not favorable. So you know, like he he was very vicious, and he used his contacts to destroy people's professions if you went against them. Wow, what a bastard! Yeah, there's you know there's a lot, the, and you know the thing is that the story of corruption, it, corruption on Long Island has been a thing. It, it sounds like since the end of the '30s. I mean, it, it, one thing after another. I mean, first it's you know the the war industry, uh, then it was the thing with the United Nations that you were talking about in your book Cold War. It's this guy. It's the PBA. It's you know the higher ups at SCPD. You know it, it's all this this crazy shit. That, that influences politics negatively. You know, now we got, like, the political police instead of just the police. It's, you know, I feel like it's just an age-old story for Long Island. And uh, thankfully, things are starting to change. And hopefully, they keep going. But, you know, like I said, I'm politically active, too. And, you know, the more people I see, the older they are. You know, when they're out in the street protesting for something, it's mostly people that are 60-plus. 70 plus so it, it scares me because it'll, you don't really see a lot of young people on the island uh, young Jesus Christ you really hang around old people too much no offense to any of you guys listen, I love you. <laughs> uh, but th- there's not enough people my age like just getting involved and just being like yo like this is our civic responsibility you know of course. And that's a big issue, you know, but I, I will say I'm optimistic, though, you know, oh, organizing yeah. is definitely, yeah, it's definitely changing in different ways. You know, like, you know, with social media, you know, social media helped overthrow totalitarian governments in the Middle East. So, you know, social media is definitely a tool not to be reckoned with. So how we organize is another thing. But, you know, when we talk about organization and activism, I just want to you know, go back to the Fire Island, uh, you know, the Fire Island activism that happened in all those communities. There's a book I strongly recommend your listeners to check out if you really want to understand successful at, um, uh, um, activism. It's called Rules for Radicals by Saul Linsky. Um, that is a recipe for successful activism. And when people read that book, it's a very short book, 176 pages. And they 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 forget what's at the core of organizing to get people to be activists, and that book essentially brings it back. And uh, I think we need people to start taking uh, a script from Rules from Radicals, you know, because yeah. uh, activism activism is finding everyone's place on the bus, everyone's personal mastery to get one objective done, you know to make sure everyone has a feeling that they're accomplishing something. When Barbash was uh, organizing to get Moses thrown from power, he went around saying, oh, you're an artist? Good. I need you to paint pictures all over Fire Island for the tourists that are going to be scenery pictures. And you're going to put at the bottom, this place is not, this place is going to be a four lane highway in three months, you know? Um, you know, like he used to find the freaking, uh, the hippies out in freaking Davis Park or the, uh, White Horse Tavern, uh, beatniks. And he told them, Hey guys, uh, how about you do clam bakes to raise money to, uh, you know, to try to, over- to fund the activism to get, o- to overthrow Moses. You know, those guys will have like pie throwing contest of, of, uh, throwing, uh, pies at Moses, uh, you know, as a dummy, you know, like stuff like that for fundraisers, you know, he made the activism fun for everyone to get involved, you know, he found everyone's personal mastery, you know, he called up the League of Women Voters, he's like, so what can you do? He's like, well, can you call these politicians all hours of the morning to keep bothering them to say you want to preserve Fire Island, you know, he, uh, he got the Cherry Grove people involved, he's like, look, you guys got contacts in the theater district, get them involved, you know, like he reached out to everyone, everyone had an active role regardless. You know, when it went to uh, Seaview, uh, not Seaview, Salt Air, which is a very Madison Avenue area, mm. he started going around. So, guys, who are you guys related to? Can we get, like, uh, ad men to do ads to pre- save Fire Island, you know? Everyone's personal mastery was discovered to work to one, um, one objective. It was a clear vision and everyone's personal mastery. It was not an impost structure. He got everyone together and said, look, he created the sense of urgency. 
found everyone's mastery and made the activism fun. He found local folk artists to do songs about Moses, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, but you know, this is a guy that understood the concepts. I don't know if he read Rules for Radicals. Uh, I know his brother-in-law did because, you know, it was in the collection. But, you know, once again, he, he, he found everyone's personal mastery. He made this movement against Moses fun. And that's and the thing, too. Moses was thrown from power. That's the thing is that a lot of the the reason why the right wing is it has all these victories is because they make it fun. The left needs to have fun. Like yeah, you know, the you know, there's some doom posting, like you know, there's some doom doomer things, but like at the end of the day, if you're not making it fun, no one wants to be around you because life sucks enough already, like. So absolutely having fun. And he sounded like a riot. Oh my god. Pie throwing contest? I would Man, yeah. that's a good idea. I'm gonna have to take that. I'm gonna have to take that. Pie throwing contest, clam bake offs, you know, get the artists involved, you know. He did it all, you know. Um and uh you know, he did everything. He's like, Look, we can do this and have fun. And Moses was thrown from power, Fire Island became a national seashore. Nice. The end. That is awesome, you know? And then you got people like Otis Pike, the congressman that Moses expected to be his friend. He wasn't his friend. Otis Pike's like, nah, you know, I like these guys. So, you know, and he went out and he went out and supported Moses and supported uh, Barbash and went against Moses. You know, Otis Pike's a different story, though. We can dive into Otis Pike. This is a guy that declared war in the CIA. Really? Um, you know, oh, my God, the Pike Papers? You don't know. Can we talk about so that? So he declared war. Can we talk about that on Tuesday? <laughs> Yeah, man. Well, listen, man, I'll just give you a little sequel. He he tried freaking declaring war on the CIA and they kept his whole investigation secret. So he spilled it to the village voice. <laughs> That's awesome. So the CIA and then, lost? And then promised the CIA lost badly. You know, he freaking made them look stupid. And then said, oh. by the way, I'm not running for re-election. Leave me alone. So... <laughs> Yeah, Whoa. but he, but he also committed. But here's the problem: he also committed political suicide by doing that. You got to look. Would you want to have Otis Pike on the inside doing that secretly? You know, uh, spilling stuff, and have him doing more terms as a congressman, or do you rather have him openly saying "f you"? I'm spilling this, mm. and only doing one last term. So you know, in a way, you can argue maybe we could have had him for a little bit longer. You know, the CIA might have been even more weaker. You know, maybe so. Which yeah, yeah, impressive. but look, you, you, yeah, but listen, Otis Pike was impressive. The guy was a rogue, you know. He was a maverick, you know. That's a fact. Otis Pike was a maverick, you know. Otis Pike, um, you know, even, even yeah, Otis Pike's amazing, man. You know, it's um, it's kind of hard to come up with something negative about that guy. You know, he uh, he, he was a good guy. You know, he was all around good guy. He, he believed in the higher cause. You know, you might you might you might disagree with him on political things, but he listened, you know, and took into consideration and made your point matter no matter what, you know. So, you know, he, he declared war on the CIA. That's pretty freaking bold, man. You know, look that up, uh, you know, and I'm sure Wikipedia has something on that, too. I don't recommend that. My Cold War book details that a little bit. But uh, Otis Pike was amazing. And like Moses did not expect that Otis Pike would smile in his face and say, I disagree with you. So that's awesome. Yeah, that was huge. He ended up getting yeah. Moses well, got screwed anyway, and Otis Pike, the Marine, was was the one that put a nail in the coffin. <laughs> yeah, he put a big nail in the coffin on Moses. Moses did not expect that. He was really pissed off. He thought he was gonna fall in line. He told Otis Pike to fall in line, and Otis Pike's like, "Yeah, sure, I'll fall in line, not with you." So <laughs> you know, and and even like Rockefeller, Governor Rockefeller at the time. Yeah. He went into Rockefeller's office because damn, like David Rockefeller um, uh, was starting to be with the protesters in Fire Island because he used wow. to be Haitian over there. He thought it was fun to get involved. And that's Rockefeller's brother. Wow. So he went to Rockefeller's office and he's like, yo, you better put your brother under wraps, you know, or I'm going to start spilling things into the news. And uh, Nelson Rockefeller's like, I, you know, you can try to do whatever you want. He's like, you know something, Betty Ann, I'm going to resign from all my positions and you'll be screwed. And he's like, okay, resign from uh, your positions. And they did. So Moses resigned from half his positions, or more than half. And then he's like, now you're really in trouble. And he walked out of the office. And then, like, Long Island Parks Commission was one of the positions he resigned from. 
And then he came back. He's like, better yet, like next day, he's like, I want my positions back. And Nelson Rockefeller, the governor, is like, I gave it to uh, my brother Dave. He resigned, you know. My brother Dave's active been trying to make this uh, park, so I gave him your position. <laughs> so Moses really was pissed off on that, too. Um, you know, another person that was really a trove of knowledge on this was Lee Kulpeman. He's called the power broker of Suffolk County. Lee Kulpeman's another great guy. He passed recently, unfortunately. Lee Kulpeman was the guy that founded Suffolk Community College. Wow. Um, he's also the guy that literally created the parks of Cathedral Pines, um, Blydenburg, Garden Manor Park, you know, a lot of county, every county park you can think of, he created. Like, Lee Kulpeman was a really good guy. And he couldn't stand Moses whatsoever. And a lot of this stuff comes from interviews with him. I got hours of interviews with Lee Kulpeman, another amazing guy, you wow. know. Um, God bless him, by the way. But Lee Kopman, yeah. he had so much stuff on Moses, you know. He used to tell me so much stuff. Lee Kopman, like, he, he said, Moses, the, if you want to compare him to somebody, it's Trump. <sighs> I, it sounds like he's you even know, worse. He's, Hello? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm back with you. I don't know if he's worse than Trump. Um. I don't know. Trump became president. You know, I, you know I, I've been so, president, so I've been so like involved just trying to survive during the Trump presidency that I was just kind of like, I almost forgot what, what like some shit that happened just because like I was so busy opposing things. It was just kind of like, what the fuck? You know, now I actually got a chance to breathe. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, I don't yeah. know if you feel that way or if you can understand that sentiment, but like it was a lot of shit that we had to do. Listen, that was the longest four years, man. Uh, so yeah, that was changed. very long four years. Yeah, yeah. He he. That was a long four years, and so many people came out of the woodwork. That was scary, man. You know, um, Steve. Bannon. You know, like I don't ever remember. I don't ever 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 remember truck parades for any president. You know, that's like straight up a cult. That was not even a freaking. That, that that was not even a freaking president, man. That was a cult leader, you know, seriously. Because, yeah. or a demigod, I guess, you know, I guess that's the definition of a demigod. You know, you got weekly truck parades, boat parades, you know, you're selling Trumpy dolls. Like, what what, what the hell? Yeah, he got um, a whole, a whole half of the country to, to solidly believe in something. And they were like, yeah, we're your army now. Yeah, but, you know, in order to believe in something, you have to know what the hell you believe in. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's the, thing the problem. It's still the yeah, Make like, America Great Again movement was so so divided in goals and stuff. It's like like I'll even hear people talk like you know differently. Like they're they're they they're both Trump supporters, but one likes Long Island Loud Majority and the other doesn't like Long Island Loud Majority. But they're both Trump supporters, and it's just kind of like whoa, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and then you put them together and they'll argue with each other and they'll see who's a real Trump supporter. You know, it's like you're uh, not the real Trump supporter. You're a traitor. No, you're yeah. a traitor. Ah, oh, the circular and, and the leftist in fighting uh, the leftist firing squads are becoming part of the right now. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, man, we're we're all messed up. But you know, even even when you talk about the Trump's people, uh, you know, for a group that always said "f your feelings," you know, when Trump lost, oh you know, God. they sure had. Their feelings were really hurt, man. Like, you know, for a group that says F your feelings, man, you know, I was like, oh, <laughs> really? F your feelings? Wow, man, you know, uh, you're pretty damn emotional well, now. They, you know, you're a demigod lost. When they cry about, like, censorship on the internet, don't no, don't get me wrong. Like, I do get pissed off about internet censorship, and I have complained about that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, okay, well, welcome to the left's world, dude. We haven't had a space on the internet since 2010. I mean, you know... Yeah. This is how it is, baby. Welcome aboard. Make a sock yeah, puppet, now, bitch. Now, now you know, yeah, now you know how it feels, you know. <laughs> Make a sock puppet. <laughs> oh, shit. Go outside. Wow, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. There's people. Make a sock puppet. I'll see people. I, I have some comrades on Facebook. They'll name themselves like... Brandon Che Guevara Vladimir and then like some Russian characters or whatever and it's like their fifth account of the month and I'm like <laughs> like you know like that's just what you gotta do if you wanna talk some crazy stuff on the internet you gotta remember too the internet's owned by the government it's not you know it's private companies fact. lease it 
No, it's a fact, man. You know, you got to make your own avatar essentially to, you know, um, I will say though, uh, it's also a tool once again, uh, you know, the uh, public square, which is social media now it is also a tool. You know, that's another thing, you know, you got like uh, the Mercer family that were trying to open up parlor, you know, the white supremacist sites, essentially mm-hmm. for social media, you know, they were using that to their advantage. They were harnessing all that anger to their advantage. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, the Mercer family live in Long Island. They're the ones that put Lee Zeldin in power. They're the ones that put, they helped put Trump in power. God, um, they're the owners of Renaissance technology. Yeah, he is. Uh, they're the owners of Renaissance technology, and they're from Long Island as well. Um, you know, if you ever want to talk about evil, man, you know, I don't know how much more evil you can get. You know, um, I'll give you time to check that out. The uh, Mercer family. Mercer. Talking about some creepy people. Mercer family is straight up evil, man. Renaissance technology, Mercer family. Um, they're the ones that, you know, they help make Trump who he is, you know, like he was created right here on Long Island, essentially. Why by people is like Long the Island family. the center of all this fucked up crap? Jesus Christ. You know, I ain't gonna lie. Sometimes it feels good to be in the center of the universe, but I want to choose what I'm at the center of the universe <laughs> for. Well, that's why we're here, because we're going to build, you know, a left voice. And we're going to we're going to yeah. make Long Island what it needs to be. We're going to take the good part of the 30s where it was a cute little agricultural community, <laughs> but it's not going to be racist. That's what we're going to make. Long I, will, Island. <laughs> I will say this, though. There is some cool things to be proud of. You know, environmental law. The first environmental law case started right here on Long Island. That's true. The term environmental law was coined on Long Island by Victor Yadikone, you know. And so were some um, of the most you know, the, it, housing cases, too. The all the most important housing cases, man. You know, even like when you call when you talk about the uh, the Agent Orange litigation that actually freaking got that settlement for all those Vietnam veterans and and also got justice uh, against chemical companies that were poisoning people. That was right here in Long Island. That litigation started, man. You know, so like Long Island's at the center of some good things too. You know, it's just that there's a lot of fuckery at the center of you know that's. As Che Guevara that's, that's said, drawback. I envy you Americans as you live in the belly of the beast. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's but, like, yeah, no. in a good way to, to end this, in a good way to end this is that from, you know, the German-American Bund to, you know, the Cotters to, you know, Robert Moses to the environmental fight back to even the recent Black Lives Matter pushback. There is, there's been some really crazy shit that's happened on Long Island, but there's been some really good fight back from the working people of this island. And, you know, it's always been organized labor and organized communities that have always united together to right the wrongs of history. Exactly, exactly. You know, you always got to, I like to try to say a balance or attempt for a balance, you know, to bring things back to a sense of, uh, you know, what's right, you know, a moral compass, I call it, you know, Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, it's like trying to beat a cork down in 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 water, you know, Uh, you know, you, you, you push it down and we'll pop up again sometimes. But that struggle kind of does define us in a way, you know. Absolutely. And being optimistic wise, you know, once again, I want to go back to this. Long Island's demographics are changing, you know. Um, you know, we're not majority like um, one race anymore. You know, 30, 36% of the region is uh, people of color, you know. So right there, when you see those demographics change, you just start seeing a lot of different thought patterns change, you know. So, you know, the Long Island of uh, Moses it failed. It's not that Long Island, you know? So, you know, and like, e- even like when we talk about Moses, it's good to talk about certain communities that fought back against Levittown's race, racial causes and Moses' social engineering. Um, Roadneck Park. Roadneck Park was an amazing community. That's in Amityville. So Thomas Romano, he's the developer of Roadneck Park. Thomas Romano was a World War II vet. And he came home inspired with the idea of like fighting tyranny and you can still fight it when the war is over hmm. at home. So he took all his resources and he built a home, um, a community that was supposed to be in rebuttal to Levittown with the racial covenants clauses. Hmm. He didn't like the idea that black soldiers were being turned away. So <clears throat> he got his resources and money together 
and he built Roneck Park. And he advertised the part, he advertised his community as a community that has no undemocratic racial restrictions and open to anyone of any race, color, and creed. You know? Awesome. So you yeah, you've got people like Thomas Romano that are like trying to scream over the shouts of bigotry from Levitt and Moses, you know? So, you know, you got people fighting back, you know, like the relics of the Klan, you know, you got Thomas Romano saying, fuck you. You know, you don't want to give me money. I'll find a bank that will give me money. You know, like Levittown saying they had racial racial covenances because they were worried about this. Well, I'll freaking come up with a solution myself. You know, so, you know, it is the belly of the beast. But, you know, we, 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 we're, we're, we're always also always trying to strive for what's right. You know, there's always someone there. This is right. That's wrong. You know, so. It's interesting, you know, Absolutely. like, uh, there's a lot of great things here. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of great like, things. It's not, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, it's, it's definitely interesting to talk about the fuckery. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> now, you know what it is? It's that we, we have to, we have to talk about the bad things, but we also have to say that, look at all the ways we could fight the bad things and what we've accomplished doing so. And that's one of the ways that like, you know, I've learned to take the good for the bad and, you know, even in our country, like, there's a lot of bad things in our country, for sure. But our country's also done a lot of great things because at the end of the day, you know, it's the government causing all these terrible things. And, you know, the working people, which are the country, you know, we've always done the good things. And we've always pushed back against capital and racism and environmental catastrophe. Yeah. And, you know, I used to be very hateful of where I lived. And then I realized, you know there's not everything can be all bad and not everything can be all good, you know? So if I had that mm -hmm. attitude, you know, if I'm going to hold this attitude of, I love long Island, which I mean, all right. Like I, lo I love where I, where I live, but like, I want to move upstate, but, but you know what I mean? Um, you know, I like, yeah. where, I love where I live, but you know, I, I don't, I don't hate it. I have, I have some very strong, passionate disagreements cause I know it could be better, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that, that's healthy, man. It's perfect. You know, you, you, you should have that, you know. Uh, you know, you can't just go along with a program and agree with everything, you know. Uh, that, 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 that's how you make things better. And, you know, Plato always said anger is a gift. Anger motivates. Out of that frustration and anger comes change, you know. I'm not, I'm not saying go burn something down, but, you know, get your little clipboard and put something on the ballot as a referendum. That's what we do here, you know, and there's a lot of success in that. And for people uh, not to you know, follow in that, you know, it's it's like use it, use it or you lose it, man. Use it or you lose it. Yeah, that that's that's a fact, man. And um, you know, there's a lot of success stories about it, man. But you know, we have to talk about how we got here and how we're not complacent, and that's why we do got to talk about, you know, um, your Moses people, you know, your your racial covenances, your failures in conservation, because you know. Out of all that crazy stuff with Moses' failures of conservation and, uh, you know, paving over everything that's green and calling it a park, you know, Suffolk County became the first county in America to have the Environmental Bill of Rights. Really? Uh, people forget that. That's in our freaking charter. Yeah. That was put in by Lee Copeman. You know, the Environmental Bill of Rights said you can't just develop roads over everything. If you look at parks that were later developed, such as Cathedral Pines, Leidenberg, they don't look like your Heckscher State Parks. They don't look like your Jones Beach Parks. There's limited access to roads because it's not about accessibility through driving. It's accessibility through hiking. You know, you got to keep the landscape. So the Environmental Bill of Rights changed that. The Environmental Bill of Rights started the uh, demand to buy uh, development rights from farmers so you can keep the rural corridor of the North Fork. You know, uh, the, the this was the first county in America to have that. Now every county in America adopts something similar, you know? So, you know, out of people like Moses and his failure to preserve land, you got the Environmental Bill of Rights. So, you know, and now the Environmental Bill of Rights is on a state level. It got passed on a, local, on, on, on a legislative level, you know? Now it's gonna be in the state constitution most likely. And the cool thing about it, you know, the person, the people that put it in the state constitution were Republican and Democrat. It was left and right, you know, and these were people that came from Long Island. So because they were pushed by their constituents. Well, so, Doc, you know, like you gave me a lot yes. to research. 
and you gave the listeners an invaluable education about some of our the history of the island that like I I wouldn't have even thought was possible. But unfortunately, we're running out of time and I have to let you go. But I hi- I highly urge everyone to read Dr. Verga's book uh Cold War Long Island among all of his other books that he's written on, you know, World War II, on, you know, Fire Island especially, Fire Island and Robert Moses' history. I uh, Buy his buy his whole fucking library, dude. Just buy all his books because you're gonna get an <laughs> education and take one audit one of his classes too while you're at it. Um, but Doc, I thank you so much for coming on the show, and um, I, I always appreciate the knowledge bombs you drop and and continuing to educate the next generation. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, likewise, I appreciate coming on here. I'll speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. All right, everyone. Thank you again for listening to episode 185 of Backpacking America. Uh, New episodes coming out all the time. Stay posted, and until next time.